Welcome everybody. I am absolutely delighted to introduce our presenters for today's webinar, Dr. Sheila Henderson and Dr. Anna Barnett. Um, Dr. Henderson um, is currently a Reader Emerita at the Institute of Education, University of London. She began her professional life as a physical education teacher and throughout her career has maintained an interest in how we all learn motor skills, as well as in those who find this difficult. Over the years, she has published research on the motor difficulties of children, including cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, as well as children and young adults with developmental coordination disorder, or DCD, and um, specific hand handwriting difficulties. This body of work includes experimental studies of typical motor and cognitive development, surveys of how handwriting is taught, as well as large-scale medical follow-up studies of preterm children. Dr. Henderson is the principal author of the Movement Assessment Battery for Children, or Movement ABC, as uh, Sherry mentioned, and has been involved in its development since the first edition, which was published back in 1992. Since then, the test has been translated into many languages worldwide and has become one of the most widely used measures of developmental coordination disorders in the world. Dr. Anna Barnett is a professor of psychology in the Centre for Psychological Research at Oxford Brookes University. She has a BA in psychology and physical education and a PhD in child development. Her general area of research is in the development of motor control and coordination in children and adults, with a special focus on DCD. Her publications in this area include work on diagnosis, description and developmental course of DCD, examination of perceptual motor difficulties and exploration of the genetic contribution to motor difficulties. Dr Barnett worked for several years as chair of the steering committee of the International Society for Research in DCD and is co-author of the International Clinical Practice Recommendations for DCD. Dr Barnett is also a co-author on the Movement Assessment Battery or the Movement ABC3. I'd also like to highlight the significant contribution of Dr David Sugden as the co-author of the first and second editions of the Movement ABC. Sadly, Dr Sugden Sugden passed away in March 2019 as work on this third edition was being initiated and the Movement ABC has therefore been dedicated to his memory. One final point of interest, um, Drs Barnett and Henderson are also co-authors of the Detailed Assessment of Speed of Handwriting, second edition or Dash 2 as we call it, um, with Dr Barnett as the principal author and this assessment was actually also published by Pearson um, in 2020, 2024 in this year. With that, we're going to turn our cameras off now. I'll be um, behind the scenes manning um, the chat and Q&A, and we'll plan to come back at the end um, with, with a live Q&A time permitting. So, um, and I will pass you over to Dr Henderson. Thank you, Shelley. It's a pleasure for Anna and me to join you on this web or, webinar. As Shelley has just mentioned, I've worked on the Movement ABC for a very long time. In fact, I began my academic career after teaching in the 1970s as a research assistant working on the very first version of the test, and I've been involved in every edition since then. And I did my PhD with Sheila and first worked with her on the second edition of Movement ABC, published in 2007, and now the third edition, published just last year. This slide shows the plan for our session. I'm going to begin with an overview of the battery. Then between us, Anna and I will present more detailed information on the features listed here. We know that some of our colleagues on this webinar are frequent users of earlier editions of Movement ABC and may be here to learn what has changed. For others, it may be completely new. We'll do our best to meet everyone's needs. So what is the Movement ABC3? Published in December 2023, the battery comprises two complementary assessment tools. The first, the Movement ABC3 test, is a performance test administered face-to-face -face in a one-to-one -one setting by a suitably qualified clinician. The test kit, available from Pearson offices around the world, contains all the materials you'll need to administer it. The second, the Movement ABC3 checklist, is a rating scale completed by an adult familiar with the examinee or by the examinee themselves at older ages. There's a paper and an online version of both tools, which are available through the Pearson Q Global system. Both instruments can be used either separately or together. For example, 
A checklist might be used on its own in a university setting where a student with a history of motor difficulties but no formal diagnosis of DCD has sought help. The checklist scores would then provide up-to-date data on the range and severity of the student's current difficulties. Conversely, an OT in private practice who's already assessed a child on the test might ask a teacher to complete a checklist so that she can obtain further information on the child's competence in everyday life. Data from the two tools can then be combined and discussed in a team meeting convened to plan an intervention programme for that individual. Also, when appropriate, one or both tools can be used with our other assessment, which Shelley mentioned earlier, the DASH-2. This focuses exclusively on handwriting, a problem common in many of the children and young adults we're concerned with. DASH-2 is also published by Pearson, and notably, all three of these instruments were standardised on the same population. What makes the movement ABC3 special? Well, in addition to the fact that it includes two complementary tools, there are some features of each one which sets it apart from rival instruments. If we start with the test, you'll find that the items or tasks are divided into three sets, each designed to be used for specific age groups of children and young adults. Within each set, the tasks are designed to be manageable for the majority and fun for everyone. So, for example, when assessing the ability to intercept a moving object, we use a beanbag for three to six year olds and a tennis ball for examinees over 12. This means that the younger child is not faced with a task that's so out of reach that it provides the assessor with no information. And the older in individual is not asked to do something that's so simple that it doesn't yield any information and which they might find demeaning. Even when an individual has quite severe movement difficulties, the whole testing time rarely exceeds 45 minutes. And the flexibility of the mode of instruction makes it very suitable for children with multiple problems, such as those with ADHD or on the autistic spectrum. What we mean by flexibility in this case is that verbatim instructions for each task are provided but in situations where it becomes clear that the examinee has not understood a task or is not concentrating, then the instructions can be adjusted. Moving to the checklist, the focus of the motor section is very much on everyday life activities. These complement the tasks in the test and are also age related. To give an example, respondents are asked to rate a four-year-old's ability to fasten large buttons on a coat. And for those over 12, the equivalent item is doing up small fastenings with one hand, such as fastening the buttons on a shirt sleeve. By using the checklist with more than one respondent, such as a parent and a teacher, the scores provided offer valuable insight into how the examinee is coping in different settings. Also important is the availability of the self-report version of the checklist a feature which is in line with recent thinking about assessment in general. That is, that the views of the examinee are crucial to the process as a whole. Finally, to the best of our knowledge, the fact that both tools provide information on non-motor factors that affect, might affect motor performance and learning is unique, and we'll describe these later. The movement ABC3 is similar to other motor tests in that it's frequently used to identify and provide a standard measure of movement difficulties or delays in children and young adults. It's often used to help make a diagnosis of conditions such as developmental coordination disorder and to help clinicians decide whether that young child or young adult is eligible for a particular service or type of intervention. The range of qualitative information, which emerges from both instruments, also helps with detailed report writing and intervention planning. Each edition of the Movement ABC has also been used in a wide range of research products, research studies. These include follow-up studies of prematurely born children, 
comparisons of deaf children with and without associated vestibular damage, documentation of motor difficulties associated with cancer treatment, and many others. For those of you who may be new to Movement ABC3, this slide simply summarizes where in the world previous versions have been used and with what groups. There are more than 15 translations of Movement ABC2 and over 4,000 published papers in which the battery is cited. Of particular interest though, to the practitioners listening today, might be the many different groups for whom the test has proved useful. In a few cases, this has led to adaptations of the battery being published, as for the visually impaired, or recommended in an influential publication, such as the DCD International Clinical Practice Recommendations, which was first published in 2019 and is now being updated as we speak. So some of you might be asking, why is it necessary to revise a test which is so well established? Well, actually, all tests that include normative data have to be updated regularly to ensure that the content doesn't go out of date and that the norms continue to be appropriate for the intended population. The stages involved are specified by the professional bodies which are shown on this slide. For those in the United States, the one on the top, which is produced by the American Psychological Association, will be familiar. The stages involved are also specified by these professional bodies and include the appointment of an expert panel, extensive pilot work, and a large <clears throat> standardization study. The Movement ABC manual describes the theoretical basis of the test and checklist. And we use this holistic model to acknowledge the interplay between factors related to the individual, the environment and the task itself, which all influence motor performance and learning over time. And you may be familiar with this or maybe a similar model, for example, the PEO model used in occupational therapy. In a testing situation, you'll be aware of some of the environmental factors which can exert their influence. For example, in an unfamiliar one-to-one -one testing session, You'll also be aware that characteristics of the task itself can influence performance. For example, the difficulty level or the particular rules to be followed. But factors relating to the individual themselves are often the main focus in assessment. Of course, there's a wide range of individual factors, including physical, cognitive, perceptual, motor, social and emotional aspects, which can each influence performance in a positive or a negative way. And a particular feature of Movement ABC3 that emerges from this model is the formal recognition of both motor and non-motor factors that interact and affect an individual's performance and learning. And we'll say more about this later on. So the model just described can be broadly mapped onto the framework of the ICF, which some of you may use, the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, which also recognises the range of environmental and personal factors that influence activity. And a completely new feature of Movement ABC was partly influenced by the ICF framework, which has a focus on participation in everyday life activities. From this, there's now increased interest in assessment, not just on the measurement of motor difficulties, but on better understanding of the impact they have for an individual's participation within their own particular context. So we now include a new section of the checklist, which allows you to document that impact on participation. And going beyond the ICF framework, we also look into the impact on more general aspects of well-being and quality of life. So in practical terms, let's show you what this means for the content of the two assessment tools within Movement ABC3. First, both the test and checklist are saying the same aspects of motor competence, but in different ways, which we'll see later. The test also provides an opportunity for additional qualitative observations. 
Second, both instruments include similar sections that consider the range of non-motor factors that might influence motor performance and learning. And third, as I've just mentioned, the checklist includes a new section on the impact of the motor difficulties. So together, the two tools offer the assessor a range of useful quantitative and qualitative information to provide an holistic understanding of the individual. We'll now move on to more detail on the motor components of our instruments. Since Movement ABC was first published, awareness of the needs of young adults with movement difficulties has increased quite dramatically. And one of the exciting new features of Movement ABC3 is the extension of the upper limits of the age range of both the test and the checklist to 25 years, 11 months. The lower limit of the test was previously three years, and now the checklist also goes down to that age, so the range is the same for both instruments, and both have the same age bands, 3 to 6, 7 to 11, and 12 to 25 years, with separate record forms and checklists for each age band. And the production of the Movement ABC3 test and checklist took place in parallel, and this offered us the opportunity to better align the content of the two instruments. So in both, we now group the tasks assessing movement competence under the three domains shown here, manual dexterity, aiming and catching, and balance and locomotion. In total, there are 10 tasks in the test and 40 questions in the checklist. Both tools also offer a useful traffic light system to categorize and describe the total scores. And this is based on percentile ranges with red indicating scores in the poorest 5%, which indicates a significant movement difficulty. So if using both instruments, this allows you to see the extent of difficulties across the more objective measure of the test in a one-to-one -one setting, and the more subjective report of difficulties noted across everyday life tasks. So now you've had a brief overview of how the instruments align with each other. We'll now turn to the content of the test in detail. Those in the audience who own a Movement ABC 2 kit will be pleased to hear that the new one is now lighter in weight and that you can allow much less time for setting up the testing room. All of the materials shown here, including new jumping mats, a line walking strip and new balance boards, meet the highest health and safety standards, as you'd expect. The purpose of this slide is simply to show you the overall organisation of the test with its component parts. Anna has noted that the test covers three areas of performance within the motor domain. If we then look down the second column of the slide, you can see that each one is then subdivided. In the domain labelled manual dexterity, there are four tasks within each age band. For aiming and catching, there are three. And for balance and locomotion, there are three. That makes 10 tasks in total at each age band. I'm going to describe the content of each of these subdivisions in just a second. But having decided on what was to be assessed within each subdivision of each domain, our next task was to create a progression through the age bands whereby item difficulty increases as the examiner gets older. In some cases, this is achieved by the same task, but with more and more difficult requirements. For example, if you look across line one of the table, you'll see the name of the task for everyone is drawing circles. But at each age band, the circles to be completed get narrower and narrower. At other times, the skill to be measured remains the same, but the nature of the task changes, as shown in line two, from posting coins, placing pegs, to turning pegs. So to illustrate this content in more detail, and to bring the tasks to life for you, we'll now use age band one as an example. And at the same time, I can mention any changes for those familiar with Movement ABC2. So here are some children doing the manual dexterity tasks of age band one. 
there are many different classifications of hand use, as I'm sure you'll know. In the Movement ABC, we focused on four aspects with accuracy being the main measure in the first and speed being the main measure in the other three. So to begin with, we aim to measure the ability to control a writing implement with accuracy. As you can see the little boy trying to do here on the right of the slide. He's given a task which requires them to draw round circles where the boundary lines get smaller and smaller. Incidentally, this is the only task in the test that relates directly to handwriting. This task is followed by a unimanual task, which involves one hand playing a primary role and the other playing a supportive role, as you can see on the left. The child puts plastic pennies in a box with one hand as fast as possible, and both hands are tested. At older ages, a pegboard task is included. The third task requires the coordination of two hands, as in bead threading. The same little boy you can see in the second column on the slide. Again, here the beads get progressively smaller as the examinee gets older, so the task becomes more and more difficult. And the last task in this domain is one which requires a greater degree of motor planning than the other three. Here you can see the little girl working out how to thread the lace through the holes in the specified order. For those of you familiar with, you, with the test, you'll find that the changes made to the manual dexterity section rationalise the content both within and across the age bands. The unimanual and bimanual tasks are quite similar, but they're more consistent across the age bands. The graphic task is new, and a task which involves more planning is included at every age band, which it was not before. In everyday life, there are skills involving only aiming, tossing something into a waste paper bin, for example. Skills involving only catching, catching your car keys thrown by your partner. And skills involving both combined, as in many sports, basketball, volleyball, tennis, you name it. In Movement ABC3, each age band includes three tasks, which together assess each component separately, then in combination. So projection of an object, reception of a moving object, and both combined. You can see here the three aiming and catching tasks, which are included for children aged three to six. In the first, the examiner throws a beanbag to the child 10 times. That happens to be in the middle of this slide. And the number of correct catches is recorded. In the second, the aiming task, a beanbag is thrown onto a mat. And in the third, the child has to bounce this large ball and catch it. And at other age balls, age groups, a ball is involved rather than the large ball, tennis ball. Next slide, please. Like motor tests, most motor tests, movement ABC3 includes a static balance task at each age band. Standing on one leg is very common and we include something similar. To assess locomotion or dynamic balance as it's sometimes called, we also include two tasks with different demands. Both have spatial constraints, walking on a line in a particular way or jumping or hopping in a specified way. What makes them different is one involves slow controlled movement and the other more explosive continuous movements. So here we have a child walking on tiptoe along a line and another jumping with feet together in a series of squares. To conclude this description of the test content, it might be useful to mention at this point that this structure has been supported by factor analytic studies for each of the, of the editions of the test right back to 1992. Now, we'll describe very briefly the quantitative information obtained from an assessment. For individual tasks, the manual provides scaled scores based on a distribution with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. 
To summarize performance on the test as a whole, we have several different scores. There are T scores for both domain and test total. There are percentile ranks with confidence intervals. And as Anna mentioned earlier, there's also a traffic light cut score. In this, the examiner may classify the examinee scores as in the red if they fall at or below the fifth percentile, in the amber if below the 15th, and green if they fall at or above the 16th. And there are wording to support this. Red being denoting a significant movement difficulty, green suggesting no movement difficulty detected, and amber in between. A much improved feature of the third edition of the test is the framework provided for the qualitative observations that can be made on each task and summarized across the tasks in each domain. We really recommend that these be used as they help practitioners describe the nature of a child's difficulties in detail and make report writing easier, among other things. So for example, this five-year-old took 65, then 68 seconds to thread the beads, obtaining a sales score of four, which is slow for her age. By observing things like her posture, which was good, the way she gripped and oriented the beads, which was poor and inconsistent, and her ability to coordinate the pushing and the pulling movements required by each hand to thread the lace through the bead, which she found very difficult, we can build up a picture or image of her performance. That might not be quite good, as good as a video, but it will pinpoint specific problems that she encountered. Then, if we find that these observations are common to several of the manual dexterity tasks, as shown on this table, we can start to generate hypotheses about underlying causes, for example, or ideas about the key features of the child's difficulties that could be worked on in an intervention program. We could spend much more time on this feature of the test as it's often neglected, but that's for another time. We'll now move on to illustrate the motor component of the checklist. As mentioned earlier, the content of the test and checklist covers these three domains, manual dexterity, aiming, catching, and balance and locomotion. And the respondent for the checklist needs to have had the opportunity to observe the individual's performance across these areas. As we've seen for the test, there are many different ways the hands can be used. And in the checklist, we found it helpful to divide this broadly into tasks related to personal care, others related to home, class or work activities, and those more related to drawing, writing and keyboarding. Now we have eight items for each of these sections. And here you can see examples from age band one for children aged three to six years. Can they fasten large buttons? Can they pick up a small object using thumb and finger? Can they write recognisable letters? Then we have eight items for aiming and catching. For example, can they kick a large stationary ball forwards? And then eight items for balance and locomotion. Can they walk on tiptoes for at least five steps? We can see how some of these items relate to the tasks in the test but also refer to a broader range of everyday activities in each of these domains. The scoring of the motor items for the checklist is on the same scale as the previous edition with higher scores indicating greater motor difficulty. In the new edition, we've clarified the categories with some further explanation in the manual. A score is given for each item on the checklist and to obtain a score of zero, the rater must judge that the individual find this particular task easy and can perform it with no help, extra time or effort. If they're totally unable to perform it, then a score of three is awarded. And the traffic light system can be used to describe the level of performance for the total score and for each of the three domains, manual dexterity, aiming and catching, balance and locomotion.
In previous editions, the checklist was designed for completion by teachers but was in fact used with parents as well. And in this new edition, we've ensured the content is appropriate for both. And for the older age band, for 12 to 25 years, we've also developed a separate version for self-report, which is proving popular with those working in post-school settings. And sometimes it's useful to have more than one respondent. For example, both the self-report and a teacher, or both a teacher and a parent to get a broader perspective of judgments of performance. After that brief description of the motor components of our test and checklist, we now turn to what we've called the non-motor components. I'm going to begin with the part that's common to both instruments and is labeled non-motor factors that might affect movement. As Anna indicated when presenting the model which underpins the structure and content of the movement ABC3, we work on the assumption that it is never actually possible to obtain a pure measure of motor competence that's uninfluenced by other factors. Non-motor factors always play a part at every level of performance and in all contexts. So in a testing session, we try as assessors to create the best possible environment for the examinee to, depress, to demonstrate their best possible level of motor competence. A quiet room, a chair that's the right height and tasks that are fun to do. In everyday life, however, creating an environment that will facilitate best performance in the real world is not so easy which is why we try to assess the influence of non-motor factors in both instruments. This slide shows part of the non-motor section of the test and the checklist with identical content. Think back to the last child you tested on either the movement ABC or for that matter, any other test like the bot. Do any of these descriptors ring bells? Timid, lacks confidence, very anxious all the time, underestimated their own ability, or perhaps a totally different child who was impulsive, overactive, distractible, had a wonderful time, but didn't do very well. Of course, a good clinician will note these characteristics in a report, but in Movement ABC3, we record them formally. And for the checklist, we provide a traffic light system for judging the extent to which these factors might be affecting the examinee's ability to demonstrate their true motor competence. Finally, I'll describe briefly the section that is specific to the checklist. In this new section, which Anna earlier described, there are six questions on the impact of movement difficulties on different areas of everyday life, such as general self-esteem, progress at school, college or in the workplace, relationships and family life. The respondent is asked to rate the extent to which each of these areas are affected. Not at all, a little or a lot. To give a total maximum score of 12 with higher scores indicating greater impact. The respondent is then invited to give examples of that impact at home, in education or in the workplace, or during sports or leisure activities. For the oldest age group, there are also questions on driving. Now, these examples come from the record form of a 19 year old who scored in the red zone of part one of the checklist and in the amber zone on part two. Using the self-report version, they rated themselves as having significant motor difficulties and a wide range of non-motor problems that they, fe they felt had learned their motor learning over a long period of time, as well as in the current situation. This included a lack of confidence, being anxious and being upset by failure. When completing the examples of the impact section, they noted that their motor difficulties affected their self-esteem and progress at college a lot. They wrote, at home, 
I break and spill things all the time. At school, or college in this case, at college, I have trouble taking notes and keeping focused. It takes me longer than others to do practical lab work, and this sometimes makes me late. In the next section, he simply says, I'm too embarrassed to take part in any sport or leisure activities. In this last section, there's just time to make a few points about the psychometric data for movement ABC3, which is described in detail in the manuals. And then we'll present the data from just one case study for illustration. So the standardization data for movement ABC3 were collected between 2021 and 2023 on a stratified sample of over a thousand participants. And I believe on this webinar, we have delegates from several different countries. So I think it's of interest that there's a move away from single country norms and where appropriate, now more common to combine norms across countries. And in our case, the norms came from the UK, Australia and New Zealand, which do have similar education systems and similar provision for students with special needs. Importantly, we did check for any country differences, but found none. So we were able to combine the data across the countries. During the standardization project, various aspects of reliability and validity were also examined, as you would expect, and these were reported to be good. For example, one study showed a high correlation of 0.7 between the movement ABC3 test and the latest brunitz ozereski test, for those of you who are familiar with that one. We also looked at the clinical validity in a group with developmental coordination disorder, or DCD, or dyspraxia. And as mentioned earlier, the movement ABC3 is often used with this group. So it's important to show that the test can distinguish between those who actually diagnosed with the condition and those who are judged to be typically developing. And here we see test data from a group of 41 individuals with DCD compared to typically developing TD controls. And the scores on the test were significantly lower for all three domains and for the total motor score, demonstrating that it does distinguish well between the groups. Finally, just to bring both instruments together and demonstrate the range of information that can be obtained from the tests and checklist, we have a case study of a young woman aged 18. I'll tell you a bit about her. She was diagnosed with DCD as a young child, and early on she had some occupational therapy and some support at primary school, but very little support subsequently through secondary school. After leaving school, she, was, she recently started work for a charity, but found herself really struggling in the work environment. And her parents encouraged her to be seen at a private clinic where she was assessed by an occupational therapist and a clinical psychologist and completed the movement ABC3 test and the self-report version of the checklist. And you can see her scores here. Firstly, on the test on the left, you see she scored at or below 50, the fifth percentile in the red zone, both overall and in each of the three domains. And when assessing her, the occupational therapist noted that she seemed to lack confidence, underestimate her own ability, was very anxious and upset by failure, all of which she noted in the non-motor section of the record form for the test. The checklist scores are shown on the right and in part one, the motor section, she scored in the red zone overall and in all three domains, noting a wide range of difficulties on the everyday tasks included in the checklist. In part two, the non-motor section, her responses echoed those noted by the OT. She felt anxious, timid, and had a fear of failing in movement situations. Finally, in part three of the checklist, she reported the impact of her motor difficulties noting that they affected her general self-esteem and progress in work, but not her relationships and family life. And in the last section of part three of the checklist, 
She described the impact of her movement difficulties at home, in work and in leisure activities. At home, she described being unable to prepare a meal for myself from scratch because I struggle to organise myself. Everything takes me a lot longer than other people, which causes me to get really tired and frustrated. She also noted she was currently off work due to high levels of anxiety and depression. I feel anxious because no matter how hard I try, I just physically can't keep up with the demands of the job. My lack of coordination and poor organisational skills affect me greatly. It takes so much more effort physically um, to do absolutely everything. And finally, out of work, she loves helping out at the Riding for the Disabled Association, but really struggles to participate and support the young people properly because I struggle to untack the horses and run alongside the children whilst they're riding. There's also a section on driving, as Sheila mentioned earlier, but in this case, she reported that she doesn't drive and doesn't think she'd be able to learn or be safe. All in all, this describes the impact of her difficulties in her individual context at this point in time. And this information should be valuable in helping to set priorities, plan support and the next steps in relation to both her personal home life and her employment. Thank you, Anna. I think that case study, study illustrates beautifully what the Movement ABC3 has to offer to the practitioner. Indeed, it almost makes these last two slides redundant, but I will summarise what we've covered today. The Movement ABC3 contains a test and a checklist, now better aligned, which cover an identical age range from 3 to 25, assess motor competence in three domains, assess non-motor factors which might influence motor performance and learning, and provide a variety of quantitative and qualitative information. And a feature we've not spent much time on today, each has new digital options available in Q Global. With these many and varied features, we feel that the norm reference scores for Movement ABC3 may play a crucial role in the diagnostic process and an important part in decision-making about service provision. The enhanced quantitative and qualitative information will assist with report writing and, most importantly, with intervention planning. So together, these two instruments should continue to serve these purposes well. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Henderson. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, and I hope everybody um, listening found that as interesting as I did. Um, I'm, we've had a few questions come up, but if um, we've, we've got a few minutes for Q&A. So if there's anything that came up um, during the session that anybody wants to ask, please put it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to um, just turn to a few questions here um, live, if I may, and um, hopefully be able to answer them. So. First one came up. Um, are the criteria the same for the items that haven't changed? So, for example, um, the catching items for a three and four year old um, in the previous version that allowed the child to use their body. Um, have those changed in, in the third edition? Um, I don't know which one of you wants to have a go at that one. Do you want to answer it, Anna? <laughs> OK, well, I will. Um, for the most part, they are the same. Um, that, for example, I think at age um, age band two, the ball is allowed to bounce as it was before. So they're very similar. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you very much. And that, just, just to say, there are some age-related differences. So the youngest children can trap the ball and then the older ones can't. So, yeah, it's very similar to how it was previously. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, another question that came up. There's a few questions um, along the same sort of... Um, um, vein here and excuse me see inside my face I'm looking at the questions on my other screen as they came up so um so um a few I'm going to summarize this in one question so 
is it, um, can you administer or, or do you need to administer the whole assessment for the, for the movement ABC3? And we're talking about the test component here, or can you administer just sections of it and still obtain a score? I think the proviso would always be that if you don't use the whole test, then you do lose out. But there may be reasons. And for example, the test has been used to look at hand function in hemiplegic children. And of course, in some cases there, the lower limbs weren't functioning, so they were only using the manual dexterity section. It's quite rare, but it wouldn't be impossible. I mean, Shelley, you may have a view on that as a, an OT, a former OT. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, yes, you can. You can just use sections of it. Obviously, the full assessment is more robust, um, but, you know, it, there might be an occasion where one wants to administer just a section of it, and perhaps if you're doing some follow-up assessment as well. So, Obviously, the preference is to do the whole thing, but there might be situations, as, as Dr. De Dr. Henderson said, where, where um, you may choose to administer just one section of it. And, and it may be if you go in the opposite direction. If you actually are assessing a child who's got a, se a severe handwriting problem and you're trying to disentangle whether there's a motor component or whether it's spelling, language, movement all combined, you might want to do the manual dexterity section of the test and perhaps look at that section in the checklist which deals with um, typing, texting and so on. So you could get an all round picture of the use of the hands. I was so, going to give that example because I know some practitioners do use it like that where they are really interested in one particular area. And so, but they would do the full manual dexterity with all of the items in there. Sure. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so there's a couple of questions here as well about um, OTs and PTs because um, so occupational therapists and physical therapists. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of take a punt at this one, but please, um, Dr. Barnett, Dr. Henderson, chime in if you've got anything else to add here. But um, we there's a couple of questions saying, is it mainly OTs that are using these or are physio or physical therapists using them as well? I say yes, absolutely. Both groups are using them. Um, we do find, I think, Historically, it's probably primarily been used more so by OTs because they've done more assessment in this domain. But we are absolutely seeing um, way more um, physical therapists, physiotherapists using it. Um, so I think it, it does actually speak to both those professions. And I think it, it, it boils down to, you know, who's administering the tools in the clinical or educational setting that you're working in and sort of, um, you know, determining, you know, which assessment is most appropriate. But I don't know if you guys would have anything to add on onto that piece. Yeah, I think it, it also depends on the service provision in that particular area or that country. And we certainly see variation from country to country. So for example, in the UK, it's, it tends to be that most children with developmental coordination disorder, for example, are seen mainly by occupational therapists, also by physios, but mainly by occupational therapists. And so they're often the ones to use the test with that group. It's completely different in the Netherlands, where there it's physiotherapists who see that group of children. And that's just because of the, the provision in different countries and the different clinical pathways. But we certainly see large numbers of both those um, different professional groups using the test and and, and sometimes, you know, uh, doing an assessment together. So they're bringing different expertise to that assessment session as well. Yes, yeah, just to add to the bit of doing it together, we've been recently in touch with a Danish group who actually are psychiatrists to begin with. And they're um, working with the children of people who are schizophrenic, bipolar and so on. And that's a team approach. So they have a psychiatrist, a paediatrician, a physio, and an OT. I mean, they all don't all see these children all the time, but they work as a team. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, another one. Um, let me just have a look. Um, who? I think. I think. Um, Dr. Henderson, you may have mentioned this at the beginning, but I can't remember because when you talked about some of the different clinical groups um, that you know the test has been used with, um, would the movement ABC3 be appropriate for a child with cerebral palsy um, impacted on various levels? I know you talked about um, um, diaplegia a second ago, but I'm kind of just curious if you've got any further comments on, on that clinical group. 
Well, I think that's a, a hot potato, isn't it? Because it depends on the level of severity. And, and there are some people who don't see a dividing line, particularly in some cases, between very, very mild cerebral palsy and DCD. And you'll find DCD kids who've got a very funny gait, and the physio will say, mm, yeah, well, that's a mild CP. So it's a judgment call, I think. Um, and I think you have to also look at the content of the test and what it is you're trying to find out. So if, for example, you use the manual dexterity tasks, they will be, these scores will be relevant for school and the implications for the child in school. Whereas the lower limbs may not be so much. I think it is very much a clinical judgment. I think also in terms of, you know, you, ha you have to see whether the child, whether the, the test is suitable in that the child can actually attempt the tasks so that the level of difficulty is not so severe that actually it's not a suitable test for that individual child. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so another one. Um, um, I see the movement ABC3 as appropriate to use for with um, individuals on the autistic spectrum or with the autistic spectrum disorder. Do you find that the flexible instructions help people with autism or a communication delay to understand the, the directions or any further comments to add on using with that particular group? You want to answer, Anna? No, go ahead. I was just going to say that it is a group where the test has been found very satisfactory for that very reason that we allow flexibility of instructions in a variety of ways. So the short answer is the test is about motor competence. And you should be able to do as an assessor everything you think is possible to ensure that you're testing for motor competence, not something else. So that could be attention, it could be understanding, all the non-motor things that we've just we've just talked about. So we permit that, and that's written up extensively in chapter two of the manual as to how adjustments might be made. Wonderful. Perfect answer. Thank you very much. And there's one comment, I'm just going to say this because I think it was just a comment in, in relation to using it with um physical therapists or physiotherapists. So um just a helpful comment that one attendee put in to say that it's also listed as one of the primary outcome measures on their um, DPP um, for developmental coordination disorder for the Academy of Pediatric Physical Therapists in the US. I just thought that was a helpful comment. Oh. So thank you. Thank you for adding that. Thank you. Um, so another one, um, this is asking just about what is the best way to get trained on how to administer the test. I want to make sure I'm administering it appropriately. Um, we do have training available um, for it, but I don't know if you um, got anything to add on that. I know there's training available through our website, um, but any further comments to add on that? Well, it is a fairly straightforward test to administer and hopefully, um, you know, we've, we've tried very hard in the manual to set it out very clearly and there is a sort of real procedures to follow in terms of you know you you give um, demonstrations the children have a practice uh, and then the formal trial so it's it's in the same way all the way through which we hope is clearly set out in the manual so it's not a complicated test to administer but there there is the initial um pearson training and I appreciate that people always sort of lack confidence when they're trying a new test so um i think it's good to sort of practice practice with colleagues and um, share knowledge and information between colleagues as well when you're first starting out to use the test. Perfect. Thank you very and much. I um, would just add that all the standard things that, that are good to do with other tests. So make a video, then work with your team, score it, and so on. And just to add about verbatim instructions, because we have many debates about this. You know, we've just talked about flexibility. On the other hand, if you're new as a new OT or a new physio and you're very anxious about it, then practice it with the verbatim instructions so that you get the key points correct. And then the flexibility comes after that as you get experience. The other thing I just mentioned is that we, we are compiling um, a, a list of frequently asked questions. So um, if 
if we do get questions, you know, I think they'll be on the Pearson website and we'll be trying to answer those. We're also very happy for people to be in touch with us. And I put my email on the last slide if, if anyone has any particular queries that uh, we can respond to. Thank you very much. Um, another one, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but do you know how long the total administration time is? I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> kind of want to say about 30 minutes, but I'll let you guys chat in. I think it was on one of the slides, but it, it's it's no more than, usually no more than 45 minutes and often between 35 and 45. I mean, we have increased the number of tasks in the tests. So if you're using the full test, it's, it's slightly longer than um, it was before, but usually no longer than 45 minutes. Well, thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of um, questions just about international, um, you know, obtaining the test international. Um, one question about obtaining it in um, that in in the African continent. Um, you sh you should be able to order it through the UK office um, for Africa, um, but sort of check our web. If you check the Pearson website, you can go to the different countries and you can find by continent where to purchase the assessments from in different continents. So there is, um, if, if you find that section on the website, it's really helpful, breaks it down um, into different continents and then the different countries where, you can, where your, your primary country is to order from. There's one person also asking um, about purchasing it in, in, I think it was Denmark, I've lost that name. Um, and, and we are working, obviously, there's, this has been translated into previous um, um, languages and, and Danish was one of them previously. Um, so we are working and we will be working on the, the Danish version in due course. I just can't remember when um, the, the, the plan date for that is off the top of my head. Um, another one, and we've got two more minutes left. So um, I just, there's another one just, Talks about um, can we use it in the US since it wasn't normed in the US? I can chime in on this, but I don't know if you um, have anything to say. What what I would say is that we, um, I think as you saw in the presentation, we did um, the data collection in the UK and Australia, which are very similar um, to uh, the US, and with all the other different um, versions that happened over time in lots of different countries as well there's a really really strong international database um, of, of data or, uh, sort of evidence of research um, that's used the movement abc in different countries um so absolutely and we know it's used it has been used historically quite a lot in in north america in the us and canada um so there's definitely a precedent for use there um not only in clinical and educational practice but also in research as well but i don't know if you guys have got anything further to add on that one well, only to say that, sorry, go on, go on. To say that we we're currently working with colleagues who are using it in in the US and and finding it very useful. That's the the feedback we've had so far. I mean, obviously, that's something we'll be we'll be tracking over time. The more it's used um, in the US, we can look at that. But we've certainly had feedback that people uh, are finding it useful, and we would expect them to be able to use it quite well in in the US. Okay, wonderful. I think we're right on the top of the hour. So I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Thank you, Dr. Henderson, Dr. Barnett, for a really informative webinar. And um, I'd just like to wish you all a, a really good rest of your day. And thank you for attending. And with that, we'll sign off. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.